Hello again. I'm Wally Wood, welcoming you to another edition of the uh, Revelation File on KBN TV. Thank you for joining us. Today marks episode five in our review of the State of the Kingdom report. Last week we started, or our last program, we started into part one in which we were discussing our, the need to return to our roots. God is doing a double work on the earth in preparing the world for the return of Christ and in preparing the church for the return of Christ. The work he's doing are not, is not the same, but he's, all, he's bringing us all to a breaking point. With the body of Christ, he's trying to bring us back to our roots, back to the, the, the place where we started with him, the place of our first love. And so he's wanting to move us into the greater works that Jesus said that we would be able to do in these last days. So step two in this process, if you will, of a four-step process, we're calling it the cornerstone of renewal, taken from John chapter 20. So in part one, step one, we were returning to our roots, and we were using Luke 18.8 as the cornerstone of that step. And when the Son of Man returns, will he find faith on the earth? And we spent that last episode defining the nature of that faith. It's just not anybody's faith. You know, Hebrews 11.6, that without faith it's impossible to please God. And we're going to cover that here in a little bit. What kind of faith? Any kind of faith? Is, is the faith of the Muslim pleasing God? Is the faith of the atheist pleasing God? You, know, you have to have faith to not believe at all. That's faith. So is that the type of faith that we're talking about? No. It's a specific kind of faith that will please God. And he identifies that faith in his word. And that episode four, we, we covered that. So we invite you to go back and take a look at that particular segment. Today in step two, we're looking at the fact that we're being called to a work and again, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 17, we're told that in this work, in this uh, repositioning, this, this uh, preparation, that you'll be able to once again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between the ones who serve God and the ones who do not serve Him. And that Peter acknowledges the fact that we are to be a people who conduct ourselves in holiness and godliness at all times. And Jesus mentioned in Luke 21, that we are to be found accounted worthy to escape all these things that would to take place on the earth. So this, these are the protocol, the, the criteria. So in step two, we're looking at the cornerstone of renewal. As we return to our roots, to the basics of our faith, our identity as believers, then we have to return to the uh, processes that even new believers have to understand and go through. In John 20, verse 23, Jesus spoke to the disciples on the day of his resurrection, saying, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. This is what we'll take a look at today. It starts with identity. <clears throat> Who we are determines what we become. In 2 Peter 3, verses 11 through 12, what sort of people ought we to be in holy conduct and godliness? 1 John 3, verses 1 through 3, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the sons of God. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Christ purifies himself just as he is pure. So the Bible identifies us as already being sons of God who are growing. And as we, the deeper we go into these things, into the Word and how the Word teaches us, the more we purify ourselves. In Philippians 2.15, that you may become blameless and harmless sons of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life. So, as we mature in Him, and as we enter into this time of Him possessing us and preparing us as His possession, we become 
more as the sons, being uh, in, in the midst of a crooked generation without fault, blameless, and harmless. So being declared sons of God by God himself, we are thereby known as sons of royalty. Sons of royalty because God is king. 1 Peter 2.9 But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, a royal priesthood. Weymouth New Testament reads it this way, But you are a chosen race, a priesthood of kingly lineage, a holy nation, a people belonging specifically and specially to God, that you may make known the perfections of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That is our task. That is our assignment. That is our work. And we come from a kingly lineage. Philippians 2.15, that you may become blameless and harmless sons of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. So at the birth of the church in the upper room, the day that Jesus raised from the dead, in John 20, Jesus is in the upper room with his disciples after his resurrection. And what you see on the, film, on the frame right there is me pointing to the scar in his hand, showing when he visited with them after his resurrection. In verse 23, Jesus says, Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. The son of royalty is royal himself. What proceeds out of the mouth of a royal is parliamentary. Where there is a ruling royal, there's no need for a parliament. A royal's words become law. This is why I think that the Bible tells us to be people of few words, because our words mean something. In the kingdom, they carry the weight of parliamentary law. To remit, in Strong's Analytical Concordance, we read this, Forsake, lay aside, leave behind, disregard, let go, omit, put away, erase, release from accountability, a judicial act. It is a judicial act. This goes beyond just forgiveness. You're wiping the slate clean as though it never happened. That's what remit means. Revelation 1.7, he has made us kings and priests unto God and his Father. That's not in the future. That's now. We are kings and priests. Ephesians 2.6, what are we kings and priests over? God has raised us up together and made us to sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Even now. We are sitting as kings and priests in his kingdom in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.37 In all these things we were made more than conquerors through him that loved us. But if you're more than a conqueror, what are you? You're a ruler. Ephesians 6.12 For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world against spiritual wickedness in high places. This is where we are kings and priests. We are not fighting against flesh and blood. It is our attention, our focus, is not on worldly affairs. It is in the spiritual affairs that impact worldly affairs. This is where we rule. First Peter 5, 7, cast all your care upon him, for he cares for you. We are not to be concerned in the things of this world. We read that in Scripture in the previous episode, and we're covering it again. We are people who are focused in our royal reign as priests and kings in a spiritual kingdom. First Corinthians 7, 15, for God has called us to peace. In this world, we are called to peace. Even in a world of turmoil, in circumstances of turmoil, we are called to peace. Why? Because we know where the epicenter is. It's not in government. It's not in politics. It's not in people. It's in the unseen world, the spirit world. And that's where we do our wrestling. 
in our prayer closets, if you will. 2 Timothy 2.4 No soldier in active service entangles himself in the affairs of everyday life so that he may please the one who enlisted him as a soldier. We are in warfare, the Bible says. We are always on the offensive. The Bible does not make allowances for a church that's in a defensive mode. It's always addressing an aggressive church, an offensive church, a forward-moving church. Luke 23, 32 through 44. On the cross, the last official thing that Jesus did was to remit his crucifiers of their crime by saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. He remitted their sin. A good case in point is the martyrdom of Stephen. Watch this. In Acts chapter 7, verse 60, falling to his knees, Stephen cried out, Lord, do not lay this sin to their charge. And having said that, he fell asleep, the scripture says. These men will not be held accountable for their murder of this disciple. Their records have been expunged of this crime. Why? Because the victim has declared there was no crime committed, no foul done. Lord, do not lay this sin to their charge. He remitted their sin. This goes beyond forgiveness. If I forgive you or you forgive me, it's still on the record. It's just something that we're choosing not to give attention to. But to remit literally means to wipe the slate clean. You cannot prosecute where there is no victim. And the victim has said, no foul done. Nothing happened here. James 5.16, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That's why I'm saying that these men will never be brought upon charges for murdering Stephen because the victim, a righteous man, prayed effectually and fervently that their records be expunged. That is what remittance, and that's what Jesus said in the upper room. He did not say, whosoever sins you forgive. He said, whosoever sins you remit are remitted unto them because it's gone out of your mouth, the son of royalty. John 20, verse 23. Whosoever sins you remit, they are remitted unto them. And this is a judicial act on the part of the son of royalty, even as in the case of, of Stephen. He put forth the request, and it's honored. Job 22, verse 28. You will also decree and declare a thing, and it will be established for you, so light will shine on your ways. A person who remits sins against him is a person walking in full peace. He's, turned, he's cast all of his cares over onto the Lord. He's being honored by having his judicial words established as law in the world of the Spirit. The gateway to kingdom power and favor begins with remittance. Lives free of regret and resentment. 2 Corinthians 3.17, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. This isn't the freedom to do what you want, where you want, as you want. That's not the liberty we're talking about here. This is a spirit existence, liberty. You are a free person, relieved and released of all pressures of all kinds. When you walk by the protocol of this walk of faith, the Bible says that the just shall live by faith. Well, actually, it, it's quoted more exactly in Habakkuk, where it started. The just shall live by his faith, Habakkuk says. When Jesus was on the earth, and he went about healing people. He said to one, Go your way, thy faith has made thee whole. To another he said, According to thy faith, let it be unto thee. The just shall live by his faith. So the question is, How big is the faith that belongs to Christ in you? How free is it to be as Christ himself is? James says that, 
as he is, so are we in this world. So how much of Christ are we really allowing to come through us? Because in order for him to come through us the way he wants to, we have to be free of all the burdens of cares and wonders and worries and anxieties, casting all that over onto him, letting him take care of all that. Now you're free in the spirit to be free. And in that freedom, you are stable. You are, you are solid. You're not dismayed. You're not caught off guard. You're not surprised. You're not shocked. You're not in fear. This, as the days get darker, those who are of the light will get brighter, who walk in the stability of this knowledge. And that's what we're talking about. It begins by you going back to the Word, returning to our roots, getting that Word into you, and then let it work itself out in you through your flesh so that now you become a cornerstone in the world of faith. The cornerstone of renewal. These are the people that in our next phase, our next part of the study, will rise up and do great exploits and be counted worthy to escape. So as we go into the next segment in our episode 6, we're going to take a, a deeper look at what Jesus meant in Luke 21, verse 36, where he said that you may be counted worthy to escape. This is not something that every believer will receive. He said, pray always. Praying always. That's, in essence, humanly impossible. Can you spend your eight-hour day working in your job, praying without ceasing? That's what the Bible says, pray without ceasing. How do you do that? Well, I can only speak from my own personal experience and, and the experience of those who've, who've had this experience, and that's being baptized in the Holy Spirit. When you try to pray in your own language, in your own understanding, your own knowledge, it takes time. It takes mental acumen. It requires a focus to pray naturally. But when you're praying in the Spirit, you can pray in the Spirit doing the work you're doing and not be interrupted or diverted in your work. That's praying always. And that's what Jesus said. Pray always that you may be found worthy to escape these things that are coming. So this does have its definite work back into prophecy and in, in the end time events. The Holy Spirit is doing a dynamic work in the church today across denominational lines. And these are things that we're going to be taking a closer look at as we go into the future in these uh, programs. We're not going to be focusing just exclusively on world events, global trends, things of this nature. We're going to be looking even deeper into the specifics of the work of the Spirit because he's trying to get the body ready for the days that are coming that were long prophesied. And Jesus said that the generation that saw these specific things that were to occur only one time would not cease to exist, would not pass away until everything had been fulfilled, which included his return. So, I hope that you're staying with us in these, in these series, in these programs, um, because we definitely see that in the days that, that we're facing right now in this nation, it's only going to get worse before it gets any better, uh, and in the world at large, everybody's being prepared for the coming of Christ, but before him is the coming of the Antichrist. I've always said that the Antichrist is pre-Christ. And right around the corner, I've said for many years that the Antichrist was in, uh, was in the wings. Now I'm saying that he's in the green room. He's ready for his appearance. And I'm convinced that his appearance is going to be very, 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 very soon. In a very short period of time. What then? So get into the Word. Return to the Word not just reading it casually like you would your newspaper or just because you've got some time on your hands. Get into the Word. Study it. 
Feed on it. Let it get inside of you. Let it do its work. You know, Jesus said that my, my sheep know my voice, and another voice they will not follow. A lot of people, are, uh, they question that. How, how do you identify that voice of the shepherd? You get the word into you, you'll hear the word speaking to you. That's how you hear his voice. The Spirit's job is to remind you of everything that Jesus ever told us. That's his job. You can't memorize the Bible. A few have tried, but you cannot, humanly speaking, memorize the Bible. But you can read it, you can feed on it, you can devour it. You can hunger and thirst after it. And in that hungering and thirsting, we have his promise that our hungering and thirsting will be satisfied, it will be filled. And I've spent years studying the word myself and have passed up many a meal because I get caught up in the tide of teaching and revelation that I'm receiving in the study of the word. You let that word get into you. You don't have to memorize book, chapter, and verse. No. But know the word. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me and learn of me. Learn me. Study Jesus. Study how he did things. Study on how he re responded to things. As that word begins to work within you, you'll learn to become a responder, not a reactor. Reaction comes from the flesh, the soul. Response comes from the spirit, the spirit of wisdom, the spirit of knowledge, the Holy Spirit within you. And again, in future episodes, I'll share some of my personal testimonies with you in which I've seen this work on my behalf, not because of me, but because of God's faithfulness to me in situations that otherwise would have gone in a different direction than they did. So in our next episode, we will address the matter of being worthy to escape, and um, that will lead to the fourth step, and that is, has to do with doing great exploits. I invite you to visit my websites, wallywoodministries.com, and the revelationfile.com. And that's just two of the five websites that I post. And our contact information is coming up quickly. But I uh, thank you for tuning in, and we invite you to tune in again for another episode of The Revelation File. You have been watching The Revelation File Report with Wally Wood, a Wally Wood Ministries production from Houston, Texas. You are able to support the ministry by donating at wallywoodministries.com and by mail at Wally Wood Ministries. P.O. Box 42005, Houston, Texas 77242. Wally is available to present full two-hour forms in your city called the Revelation File News Forum. For more details, contact Andy Valdez at 713-560-3348 or by email at andy at andyvaladez.com. The Revelation File News Report is a weekly update of global trends in the news as it aligns with end-time Bible prophecy. Tune in again next time and be sure to like and share this channel.